Hello, welcome. Uh, my name is Osagi Obasogi. I'm a, a professor at, at Berkeley in the Joint Medical Program and School of Public Health. And today I am joined by four of my colleagues who, uh, 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 who joined with me uh, earlier this year to publish a edited volume um, titled Trumpism and Its Discontents. Um, it is a volume that explores the role of uh, Donald Trump's presidency in the idea of Trumpism and its impact on everyday life, society, and politics. Um, so today I'm joined by four contributors to that volume. Uh, we first have John Powell, who is the director of the Othering and Belonging Institute and also a professor of law at Berkeley. Uh, we have Catherine Alvison, who is also a professor of law at Berkeley. We have Zeus Leonardo, who's a professor in the School of Education. And we also have Ann Keller, who is a professor in the School of Public Health. And so we're gonna talk for about 45 minutes uh, about each of their chapters and the idea of Trumpism itself and have a conversation in, in a largely Q&A format. And then we'll, we'll reserve the last 15 minutes or so for questions from the audience. So my first question as sort of an icebreaker uh, for the panel is, you know, what were your initial thoughts on January 6th when you saw the images coming from the siege of the US Capitol? Um, John, I think we can start with you. Well, uh, good afternoon, Sagi, and uh, hello to federal panelists. Um, there was a little bit of whiplash because I think a lot of us were following Georgia and uh, some may know that uh, the Elder and Belonging Institute had actually worked very uh, uh, intensely on get out the vote and civic engagement in Georgia and, and following whether or not what was gonna happen in the Senate race. And then it looked like we we're gonna pull it out and just when we were saying, yeah, then the uprising of the uh, insurrection started. Um, and, and it wasn't shocked, um, but it was shocking. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, my own thought and suspicion is that it wasn't spontaneous, that there was too much um, uh, to suggest it was not orchestrated. Um, and it's sort of I worried about best, best my country. And I have used the metaphor since then that, you know, we sort of dodged a bullet, mm -hmm. but then the Trumpsters and some, some of the Republicans reloaded a Gatling gun. I mean, it's just, uh, we're still, I think, in very troubling waters. Um, so it was, it was hard and sad at the same time. It was also somewhat irritating because we couldn't really celebrate all the incredible work that had been done in Georgia and uh, turning Georgia blue at the Senate level was really got lost. Um, anyway, those were my thoughts and feelings. Thank you. Um, KT, did you have thoughts when you saw some of those initial images coming from the Capitol? Yeah, I mean, it was, I think John put his finger on it. It was um, surprising, but maybe not a surprise because it was the culmination of uh, a sort of boundary crossing administration that had had moved in a direction of extremism already. I mean, there were a couple of things that really struck me. One was um, the the disjointure between the response of the Capitol Police and also the National Guard and other um, the FBI and and other uh, um, uh, police entities to this protest compared to what had happened in Portland or what had happened in D.C. Um, before you know, clearing peaceful protesters out of the way. And, and I had to wonder whether, you know, the, the nature of the protest, the nature of the protesters had something to do with that because it was, it was stark and disturbing and commented on quite a bit. Um, and the second thing that was disturbing for me, and again, I think I'm echoing some of what John said, was that I had read um, uh, prior to this some, um, uh, international commentary about how how does democracy fail and w when do coups happen and um, from from folks that had lived through it and one of the things that they pointed out is that it's a slow moving uh, a phenomenon that you have to respond at every instance and that um, even what seem to be silly or defeated coups can come back again and again and so. Um, it worries me for the future. I don't think this was necessarily the the period on the end of the Trump administration. Uh, and I think that it's a warning sign for things that we need to be thinking of and vigilant about in the future. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, Zeus, did you want to share any thoughts? 
Sure, sure, thank you. I think I am going to agree with my colleagues here. Um, for the last four years of the presidency and including his run up to the presidency, so five years really, um, we and I have been shocked by uh, President Trump's uh, behaviors, actions, words, and speeches. And I tried not to be shocked over and over again because it was a pattern. But this really was, again, a shocking event. Um, and it, on some level, didn't even feel real. I mean, it, I felt like I was watching a Netflix special, right? But it was all too real. And the last time I felt that way, uh, not, you know, not counting the, the shock that uh, we saw with George Floyd and other videotaped uh, events uh, of, of uh, anti-Black violence, but, and, and that, it's still a shock, but we, we're seeing so much of that these days that um, as far as a TV image, it, 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 uh, it's, it's no longer surprising. The last time I felt that way about uh, an image was the 9-11 event when you saw the World Trade Center mm -hmm. in flames. So when I saw folks, uh, mostly white in that crowd, uh, breaching the Capitol and then the Capitol building, um, it, it really, uh, you know, felt shocking again. And I tried to, I tried to, I tried to uh, resist the temptation to be shocked because again, why should I be shocked? We've been seeing these kinds of images over and over four to five years, but it was new. And, you know, I, 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 I don't want to underestimate the effect of that. I mean, words, and we will talk about words in this, in this, um, in this panel, but words like sedition were, were being used, mm -hmm. right? And a second impending impeachment, which did happen, um, was being uh, talked about. So it, it, it was not to be um, underestimated as far as what, the importance, the importance of the image, the importance of the event, the importance of the action, folks, who breached the building and putting their feet up on um, Pelosi's uh, desk. It's all very, very much shocking. But again, I, I, I tried to resist the temptation to feel that way because um, in a sense, why should we be surprised at all? So uh, those were the conflictual feelings I had uh, going back and forth, being shocked and resisting the shock. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And Anne, did you have thoughts that you wanna share? Uh, yeah, I can echo, I feel like, what all of uh, the panelists have said about the, uh, on the one hand, there's a feeling of inevitability. I mean, I think from the very uh, outset of the Trump presidency, since he initially campaigned that he wouldn't accept an election loss the first time around, I think mm -hmm. many people were already talking about what, what would it take to get this man out of office if once elected. So from the beginning, I think it's been on our minds, but at the same time, just the, 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 the images of seeing this uh, crowd of white protesters breaching, you know, initially what we could have thought would have, was a protest, but became this act of sedition, um, it, it just, very hard to take in, even though intellectually I was prepared for it. Um, I think, you know, just as a political scientist uh, who studies public administration and who really studies institutions, I think it was almost unbearable to, to, um, to watch people within the Capitol calling for help and calling for support of the Capitol Police and seeing nothing happen. Mm -hmm. And then realizing what that was, that that was, that that was the institutions of government aligned with this um, man who was trying to steal the election, kind of mm -hmm. waiting to see if they don't, if, if, if the National Guard is not gonna be set in, sent in, what's gonna happen next? And so this feeling of, of seeing this real um, attack on <clears throat> our democracy play out, where, well, where um, you know, I don't, I don't think we saw kind of, you know, there weren't active troops coming in to kind of support the sedition, but the withholding of support for the Capitol Police felt like it was a, a, a move in that direction. Um, and that long pause, that three yeah. hour wait for any support is, is what I can't, it's the piece of it that I can't, I can't quite get over. I, I feel like we will be grappling with that. Um, uh, you know, for, um, you know, years and potentially decades to come. Right, right. Um, yeah, my, my thoughts, I uh, resonate with so many of the things that you all said. And I also had this additional feeling where, you know, many of the counties that were being contested at that time that kind of gave uh, or created the motivation for what was then thought of as a stop to steal moment that led to the breach of the Capitol. So many of those counties that were contested were, um, from black uh, counties, largely minority counties. 
And so from that perspective, you know, we can think of the breach of the Capitol as not only a movement by conservatives, but it was specifically an anti-Black statement, right? It was a statement about the illegitimacy of Black votes. And from that perspective, I saw so many of the, or I, I began to think about um, some of the images from the, um, from the 19th and uh, 20th century lynching. So these photos of public lynchings, and we tend to think about lynchings as these kind of secretive private acts that happen uh, outside of view. In reality, they were often public acts that had hundreds if not thousands of people attending and there were these public spe spectacles. And so I, there was a, for me, a kind of a connection between the mob violence that we saw in the 19th and 20th century with regard to lynching and the mob violence that we saw on January 6th to the extent that there would be, be there are both be kind of deeply anti-Black uh, moments to, in a sense, threaten and intimidate people who dare to, in a sense, cross what were then thought of as kind of like certain social and political lines. And I think those ty that type of historical continuity for me was very um, important and very striking in terms of how mob violence that we traditionally think of as being something in the past, in a sense, sparked up and we saw an instance of that in, in the 21st century. Um, so for our first panelist question, um, I will start with Zeus. And um, so we have the idea of uh, an idea that uh, of colorblindness has been critiqued by sociologists such as Eduardo Benilla Silver. And he talks about it as kind of this kind of species of race speech and orientation that emerged after the Jim Crow era where it was no longer polite to talk about race in explicit terms and colorblindness became a norm to talk about uh, race and racism in seemingly race neutral terms, but still kind of preserve those kind of substantive um, discriminatory ideas. And so the question for you is, uh, are we now at the end of white colorblindness now that it seems to be less useful and as a descriptor of, or, or as an end of, or excuse me, is it is a descriptor of end of race relations? And so what has occurred uh, or what has happened to make this shift in this shift towards post colorblindness? That is to say that Trump and Trumpism seems to have a certain type of explicit conversation on race that seems to go against traditional norms of colorblindness. And are we in a new era or something different or is this simply a extension of what we saw before as colorblind norms? Thank you, thank you for the question. So, I mean, the first thing I'd like to point out is that speech, race, race speech, racialized speech is, is intimately tied to structures. So it's not that uh, speech and words are uh, divorced of the structure that gives them power. So that's the first thing I'd like to point out. So colorblindness uh, made popular both by Bonilla Silva, and it's been called other terms, laissez-faire racism by Larry Bobo and, and, and his uh, collaborators, um, is, 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 is an indication or an expression of race relations, race structures, so that Colorblindness replaces Jim Crow as a way of talking, or what I call the transparency, the transparency of racial power um, in Jim Crow becomes, you know, or transitions towards colorblindness, which is, you know, a coded uh, way of talking about race without ever really mentioning race in, in overt terms. Now, since Trump, but arguably before Trump, uh, we're talking about the, the Tea Party rise and then the importance of, of President, former President uh, Obama, um, and and his pres um, his being the first black president of this country. Um, so it it goes back before Trump. So we're, that's why we're talking about Trumpism. So it's not to be confused only with the man himself, although he may wish for that. I think <laughs> Trumpism is a broader um, framework, a broader phenomenon that dates back to something like the Tea Party or before. Uh, perhaps even farther back, you know, perhaps Reaganism. So that post colorblindness is a term um, I'm, I'm invoking here to say that it's, it's not coded. I mean, when he's talking about build the wall, when he's talking about the Muslim ban, that's very overt. It's not colorblind at all, right? But it's, and it's post colorblind to suggest that, to not suggest that colorblindness is irrelevant because colorblindness is still around. In fact, it may still be the dominant way of talking, but I think there's an assumptive discourse that's happening, which is post-colorblindness, this way of talking about race in overt ways. But it's different from Jim Crow, right? It's different from Jim Crow because the transparency of racial power 
evident in Jim Crow discourse is slightly different for that, from what I'm calling post colorblindness, which is the sense that you know white folks are arguing for being part of the sort of rainbow, you know, the racial rainbow, right? It's a sort of normalcy of whiteness and not the specialness of whiteness that's coming up. So it's it's after colorblindness, which is not to suggest that colorblindness is irrelevant, but it's not exactly before colorblindness or going back to Jim Crow overt discourse. It is overt, but its reference are different, right? Its reference are that whites would like their own sort of sovereignty, their own sort of autonomy to determine their own cultural practices, their community and identity understandings. It is a white identity politics that is basically being inserted in an, an identity politics that the left or people of color have been using. So there's a kind of normalness about whiteness in it that's different from Jim Crow. Now, of course, if you dig a little deeper, we'll probably find, you know, overt racial power reference there. But I'm talking about sort of the public way that uh, whites are now using their own racialization as whites or white identity politics. So I, I don't think colorblindness is irrelevant. I don't think colorblindness is gone. I don't think it's necessarily after colorblindness. So when I say post, it doesn't just mean after. You know, it, it, it is a marker, a post, let's say a post on the street. It's a marker that something is happening and that it's, 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 it's very different from what sociologists and others um, have called colorblindness. So, so that's, that's, that's my answer. Maybe we can circle back later. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. And I really like how you put colorblindness on a broader political spectrum, something that's been around for many years. And Trump is just the most recent example of it. It takes it to a new extreme, but, I, but not in and of itself an brand, entirely brand new idea. And I also like how you're suggesting how um, this kind of post-colorblind moment exemplified by Trump is in a sense in conversation with colorblindness itself. And I'm reminded of kind of many times where then President Trump would say something outrageous that was explicitly racist, then his defenders would come out and use colorblind language to try to clean it up and make it seem more normal. And that kind of back and forth, that back and forth just really, um, you know, led to a lot of confusion and, and, and kind of linguistic um, kind of gymnastics that kind of let people in a sense, rationalize were otherwise irrational thoughts about race in our country. And so I think that relationship is something to also keep in mind. Um, so we'll turn next to, to John Powell. And the question, my question for you is, why is group dominance more important to understand and focus on than racism or prejudice? So how are they related and how do they differ? Again, thanks for the question. Um, so in many ways, um, our Education around prejudice comes from um, Alpert and the nature of prejudice in 1954. Um, and but he spoke about it largely in terms of individual uh, response to a group, individual response to other individuals. Um, and so in terms of that, as we sort of thought of race as individual acts of um, discrimination, prejudice, stereotyping, the goal was to fix the individual, to educate her or him, to uh, offer counter stereotypical examples. And, and sometimes it was also associated, but not always, with animus. So you had stereotypes, prejudice, and animus sort of working together, but not becoming each other. Um, and so if you look at even today, a lot of the work around uh, implicit bias, a lot of the work around uh, uh, anti-racism, is really focused on fixing the individual mm -hmm. um, and that the individual has bad thoughts, bad motives, or ignorant thoughts or ignorant motives. A group dominance is a, a very different concept. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, it doesn't require animus. It doesn't even require stereotypes or prejudice. It's basically saying <clears throat> the position of my group is to be dominant. And again, very close, very close cousin to uh, group superiority. Uh, and when that position is threatened, then the group becomes both more salient, become more aware of itself, uh, and it becomes threatened. Uh, and what you're doing then is actually trying to protect the group. Mm -hmm. so, so if you think about the young man who went into the church in South Carolina, what he said is that he actually liked the people that he was with for more than an hour. Mm -hmm. 
They were very nice to him. They were kind. And he even expressed some regret that he had to kill him. Uh, and in his mind, he had to kill him in favor of his group. It's that the white people as a group, from his mind, was actually under threat uh, from the growing changes in the population, uh, from the growing assertion of, of power. Um, and that's what he was concerned of. And, and oftentimes also in the group dominance um, discourse, we assume that one group is gonna dominate another. We can't really imagine groups actually not dominating. Uh, so you have the Proud Boys saying, we will not be replaced by Jews. Um, and I can't remember Jews saying they want to replace the Proud Boys, but th there's that anxiety. Um, and so I think it's both, it, it, all those things are operating at the same time. There's individual prejudice and discrimination, there's uh, bias, uh, there's stereotyping. But what we're seeing now is group dominance. Increasingly also the group dominance is led as a leader. So Trump is the leader of the group, uh, which makes it hard to actually move people away from group dominance, even if they start having some second thoughts. Because one of the things you get from group dominance is, a, is group membership. And, and Trump makes it very clear uh, and that if you violate the norms of group dominance, then you're out of the group. Uh, and the last thing I'll say on this is that I was thinking about this yesterday and today. I think it's appropriate that we look at Trumpism and people who organize around Trumpism, but I also think it's important and under examine the people and especially the white people who don't organize around Trumpism. Uh, so there's a heterogeneity that we're not sometimes digging into. It's like we're studying the pandemic and we look at people who get the virus and get sick. It's interesting, important. But there's also people who get the virus and don't get sick. Uh, and there are people who are exposed and don't even get any symptoms. So we need to study the spectrum. Uh, and, and what we're seeing in terms of the, the large society, but certainly white society, is the spectrum in terms of this uh, different kinds of white expression. Um, and we're not, we're not clear as to what whiteness, or white ideology means. Um, period, but certainly what it means if you're not organizing around Trumpism. So what does it mean to be white in America and not organize around Trumpism? And I end this by saying, you know, Baldwin sort of posited that question to us years ago, right? And he said, there's no hope for us as long as they think of themselves as white. He was saying the ideology of white is problematic and there has to be something else, but we have never been clear on what that something else is. Well, thank you, John. You know, I've always appreciated your thoughts on this. And I think your, the framework you're, you're suggesting here, it really explains, for example, why the media had such a hard time covering Donald Trump, in part because their analysis of race was so embedded in the individual level, yet the rhetoric of Trumpism is at this kind of group superiority level that you just eloquently explained. And it, I think it took so many people like a really long time to really figure out how do we capture what's so um, difficult and harmful with Trumpism because of that mismatch between how they were conceptualizing race and racism as individual phenomenon, but yet the political claims are being made were at this kind of group level. And that's precisely why I think Trumpism has been attractive to so many people. Um, and for people who were outside of that, that way of thinking, it, it took them a long time to understand exactly um, you know, what was at stake. Um, so uh, next question is for KT. Um, how has Trump and Trumpism um, over the years affected the conversation regarding sexual harassment? So um, one of the things that I have found most um, disorienting about some of what has happened since uh, even before Trump was elected, when he was caught on mic talking about groping women and how uh, you didn't even have to ask beforehand, mm -hmm. is the way in which um, the conversation around sexual harassment has moved away from conceptualizing it as about power, workplace exclusion, gender policing, um, and moved in a different direction around individual desire, boorish behavior, or even hyper-masculinity. Um, and so Trumpism and Trump himself, I think, has changed the narrative to be about salacious details and he said she said squabbles which of course the media loved because mm -hmm. it made for good copy um, but the the result of that has been a kind of resexualizing of sexual harassment uh, as about boorish behavior rather than structural inequality and a sort of complete ignoring of harassment that isn't 
sexual in nature, but is derogatory directed at particular groups as a means of excluding them from opportunities. Um, a second consequence has been the resurgence of the sort of lying witness stereotype, especially with the results in the, in the Kavanaugh hearings. But a second, a weird kind of generalizing of that stereotype so that uh, powerful men like Vice President Pence can say, well, I wouldn't be alone with a woman uh, in the workplace because of this potential uh, for false accusations. And that ends up being, um, you know, this this claim of false false accusations, which are exceedingly rare, then becomes an excuse to avoid women in the workplace across the board and becomes an mm -hmm. obstacle uh, to, to women's uh, progress. And then the third thing that's happened is a kind of devaluing of the harm of sexual harassment and assault altogether. So um, you saw this again in the Kavanaugh hearings where uh, the question becomes whether something is negligible as sexual assault in a high school uh, uh, um, context should be used to deny the advancement of such an accomplished man. And Catherine McKinnon put it really well. She said the debate presented Blasey's sexual assault claim as a debate between her facts and his resume. Um, and this is a sort of much more mm -hmm. Um, disturbing development because it wasn't necessarily that she wasn't believed. Um, it was more that it didn't matter. And so, so why did this happen? Well, I think that um, when Trump was caught on Mike bragging about harassing women, his response was to normalize it, right? To normalize it as typically masculine behavior, as, as locker room discussion. And this is a strategy we've seen in other contexts as he and his administration normalized what otherwise would have been unthinkable misogyny, racism, attacks on democracy. And so this sort of normalization, denial of facts, um, kind of resistance to, to what had prior been the framework around sexual harassment, I think was a strategy overall. Um, it's also a pushback against something that, and, and uh, um, I think John alluded to this, uh, to uh, the successful privilege of a certain group, right? To the gender privilege of men to harass women and use gender-based but not necessarily sexualized uh, um, harassment to diminish and exclude women in the workplace. And so um, uh, to deny facts and attack the accuser is a much broader strategy that was used by Trump in a whole slew of opportunities. Um, but in this particular context, it also resonated with the cultural stereotypes about rape victims and false accusations. You know, I just want to point out that, that this doesn't, um, this, this development um, leaves off the table the people who were meant to be supported by the, the Me Too movement and uh, Toronto Burke, when she started it, it was focused on supporting um, harassment victims. And so nowhere in this, in this uh, narrative is the experience of janitors raped on the night shift or women in the construction trades being ridiculed, harassed, or demeaned for their gender nonconforming professional choices. Now it's all about powerful men being challenged by women who are probably lying um, and in a politicized attack. And, and I think that that's a real um, concern for thinking about gender equality going forward in all kinds of structural um, areas as well. And so uh, uh, while it's of a piece of the Trump strategies, uh, it's concerning about where we go from here. Great, thank you. Um, so Anne, um, in your chapter, you express more concern about how an anti-science set of strategies have taken hold among conservatives than the particular anti-science moves that were made by the Trump administration. So can you explain these concerns um, and how they might affect the direction of the GOP and how this is, has evolved since the mid 1990s? Yes, yeah, so the, um, I, um, I think, you know, in keeping with other with uh, um, other panelists and other contributors to the volume, I think one of the exercises that in here was to look at the particular stamp that Trump brings to um, to a, a, a stripe of conservatism that we're seeing now. And um, I've been studying uh, science debates, particularly around environmental politics, going back to my dissertation. And what I think was this kind of standard sort of 20th century model for conservatives and progressives to fight over regulatory issues, which were, was the area where I was doing research. And in particular, I started sort of cutting my teeth with acid rain and climate change, 
was that progressives would say there's a real problem here. We need to regulate what's going on in the private sector in order to, um, to prevent more harm. And conservatives would say, really, we don't know enough. There's too much certainty, too much uncertainty. We can't really act now. And then what we would see out of that was a sort of bipartisan um, uh, sort of default to let's do more research. And that I think sort of shored up this partnership that I would call between kind of the federal government and its role in kind of regulating the economy and science in revealing to us how that, you know, what, what was happening, kind of what, what the private sector was, was producing. And what I'm what I, noting that, you know, Trump and his appointees in the chapter, I focus on Trump's appointees to the EPA. Um, and what I noticed is that there's sort of a long, there's a, a long standing um, term where um, conservatives started to, started to figure out that the, that, 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 that what we call, um, and scholars have called kind of merchants of doubt or bending science, this idea of sort of um, generating uncertainty to avoid regulatory action is not as powerful as saying, let's not do any research. So what I've seen is this move that I call moving upstream or turning off the tap, which is cutting off um, funding, cutting off the opportunity to do scientific research uh, at, at its source so that, so that you, don't, you can't have the regulatory debate um, later. And, and that's, um, I, think, I think the Trump appointees to the EPA were sort of working from that playbook and trying to find in this regulatory environment that's, that's very codified and very formalized um, ways to try to, to choke off science available for EPA for decision making. And I saw sort of Trump as kind of an opportunist in this environment. He, I, I saw him, I think, initially as a, through the lens of, of narcissism. Like if the scientists are making him look good, he loves science. If they're making him look bad, he hates science. But I didn't see him as participating in this um, kind of much more kind of strategic move. Um, I think more recently, like th thinking about uh, the way that Trump uh, navigated the COVID crisis, um, I think I see I see that you know that, that he sort of maybe deeply he is anti-science kind of at its, at his base, not just not just the sort of opportunist that. Um, uh, um, the way that it played out in COVID it, and, and the way that electorally, I think he, he made a huge miscalculation. I think he could have led as the crisis president in COVID and gotten reelected. Um, but I, you know, he, I think when he started, it, I think he was sort of uncertain about his ability to navigate that. And so he sort of, he took this very much, um, uh, you know, anti-science, anti-fact uh, approach to COVID. Um, and I, I want to just link back to something that, that John, John Powell said about um, you know, group dominance and group leaders, I'm really informed in, in thinking about where this came from, from Claude Fisher's work around, um, he has sort of this correction for thinking of Americans as these sort of boundless like individuals. And he uses this term voluntarism, which is Americans really don't wanna to be told what church they should join, what synagogue, what party they should belong to, where they should go for employment. But once Americans affiliate with a group, they're much more um, likely to uh, follow, the, follow the, the leaders um, than their European counterparts. So we see um, Americans will say, you should do what your boss says, even if you think your boss is wrong, you should do what your ch church leader says, even if you think your church leader is wrong. And so Trump, Trump as a leader of this group is really shaping the way that they understand COVID or the way that they understand science. Um, we didn't see 370 million responses Responses to COVID, we saw essentially sort of two. Um, so I think that that, that um, uh, I think you know, uh, to, there's there's both this sort of long-standing I think move that I would locate kind of in the in the 1990s. It sort of emerges with Newt Gingrich and the 101st first sorry 104th Congress, where they begin to use their budget tools to cut off science. But I think Trump as a leader really brings something. He really animates it, and he really he really tells people who may not actually sort of um, be, at, be as committed to anti-science as sort of conservative elites to follow him down that path. So I think, you know, having seen COVID and since I wrote the chapter, I would add this piece that Trump's really fan fanning the flames. He's creating a much larger movement than I think, than, than I think would really um, exist absent his, his, his position in the presidency and absent his, the, you know, mm -hmm. his, his ability to tweet. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, so I want to return back to Zeus and uh, pick up on the conversation that we had before about post colorblindness and, uh, and really continue the conversation that you touched upon, which is this idea that uh, post colorblindness represents some form of white concessions or a series of white concessions. And I was wondering if you could say more about what those concessions might be and how they operate. 
Sure thing. I'm unmuted now. Um, so I'm that point is inspired by Gramsci and a Gramscian analysis that um, what I see in post colorblindness or um, an overt racialized speech of white identity politics is the sense that for so long, right, the modus operandi of whiteness was to not claim their racial conditioning, that to be white meant to be human, it meant to be an individual, it meant to be a person. In post colorblindness, white is a racial identity. They're carrying flags to uh, signal their whiteness and not in the Jim Crow way, right? And so I'm differentiating it from that. It's a sense that they're asserting the everydayness of their whiteness, right? And to me, that's a concession, right? It, it's, it's, it's what I call in the chapter, uh, a recent sign of white desperation. So at the same time that yes, Trumpism and Trump won, they won something. They won the presidency for four years. They won the reinvigoration of the right and the far right. But I think it's not one without, it's not one or it's not one without concessions. And so the concession is this, that whites are now at, you know, at least to themselves, because people of color have always known that white is a racial conditioning. But now more and more whites, you know, from all sectors of life are asserting themselves as white, right? as let's say deserving of respect uh, in their own eyes, right? Deserving of their own space, right? Deserving of their own um, community, you know, wishes and standards. But I think that's a concession, right? It's a concession in the sense that Gramsci or maybe Stuart Hall's Gramsci would say is that white is now coming out of the bright cave to, to sort of be ironic with Plato's cave, right? They're coming out of the bright cave into the darkness, right? Sort of the opposite. Um, in the sense that, um, you know, whites can no longer dodge the question of their whiteness. Whites have now used it and weaponized whiteness, of course, um, but it's not without a concession that, you know, that they have now come out in public as white, as a racial group, as an identity experience, one that, you know, deserves more um, critical understanding, no, no doubt. But that's what I mean about um, the idea that um, post color blindness is a white concession. It is, I don't know if it's the last straw, I don't know if it's the last straw of whiteness or the last heave of whiteness, but it certainly is a progression of the changes of, uh, in whiteness that we've seen all along. And this one to me is different, right? To me, this one is different. For so long, white meant to be a person. It meant to be a human individual. Now it is a racial label. It is, it is one that they carry and that they've weaponized, but that's not without concessions. Well, thank you, Zeus. Um, that's very helpful. Um, next question is uh, back to John Powell. Um, so when we have these discussions about race and racism and anti-racism work, we typically talk about race as if it's this kind of fixed form of identity and not a social construction. And at the same time, you know, we kind of gesture towards a social construction, but it's not really taken as seriously as, as it could be. Um, so how should we think about race and what does this mean for bridging, bonding, and defeating the divisions that were created by Trumpism? I think that's an extremely important question um, and has multiple layers to it. Um, so we give you know, a nod to the idea that race is socially constructed, but our function, our practice, uh, both on the left and right, is that race is actually still essential. And by being essential, that is, we're just, it just happens, it's natural. Uh, it does a lot of work. Essentialism does a lot of work. First of all, it erases history. So if something has a history, um, it means it's constantly changing. Uh, and it can change in the future. If we think of race as essential, even though there is changes going on, we either don't notice them, uh, and we think is permanent. Um, and by looking at someone's phenotype, we think we know all we need to know about their race. So if race can't change, and more particularly racism can't change, it disempowers us. Uh, it, and it also means that it blinds us. Um, I, I sort of alluded to in my first comments about, about the heterogeneity of whiteness or the heterogeneity of blackness or the heterogeneity of uh, Latinoness. It's hard for us to see that because we keep slipping back by default into a racial essentialism. Um, 
And, and even when we sort of assign people to a group, like if you look at a lot of the work around tribalism, uh, a lot of people will analogize what's happening now in terms of tribalism. And they'll, they'll do work about the mind science saying people naturally categorize. Uh, tribalism uh, in an explicit sense was about tribes and tribes were small, usually from 50, most of them around 50, big tribe was 150, but there were people you had contact with every day. What do you have co in common with these people? It's like, it's your family. This is the people you've lived with your entire life. What do people who are phenotypically white have in contact with, you know, have any, any relationship with each other? It's, it's social. So at the, at the height of uh, Nazi Germany, uh, Hitler was clear there were four different types of white people in, German, uh, in Europe and they were hierarchical. Uh, and only the Nordics were the really pure white people. The rest of them were, you know, maybe. Uh, that sort of consolidated. Uh, so what I'm suggesting is that there's no natural group. Uh, we naturally think, I mean, people oftentimes will say, you know, people want to be with their own. It's like, who's my own? You know, uh, 200 million white people, that's my own? I don't think so. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, that, that has to be worked through. And, uh, and if it's not worked through, again, it, we lose the capacity to interrupt and move it. The last thing I'll say on this is that if, if race is socially constructed, as it is, and identity is actually socially constructed, it means it's constantly moving, but it means we get to participate in the construction mm -hmm. of that. We don't control it, it's social, it's not individually controlled. Is socially controlled. And uh, so that reflects in terms of uh, how we do where people live and uh, where people go to school, um, uh, who gets on television, uh, who gets to go to the university, who's deferred to, all of these things. But we can interrupt that once we are aware there is this social construction. Uh, and we can imagine uh, a white race or a white group that doesn't need to dominate. We can imagine that, uh, which is hard to do in America. Uh, and it's, it's hard not only for us to do, you go back to Dred Scott, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, he couldn't imagine white people not dominating. Mm -hmm. uh, Lincoln, even as he moved to his progression of becoming more racially conscious, it was hard for him to imagine white and black people living together. He said, you know, okay, he, I can imagine black people not being slaves, but you gotta go. <laughs> you can't stay here. It's not conceivable. Uh, so, I, so part of it is it sort of narrows our, our imagination. We can't imagine a future where people uh, are living into their multiple identities um, and living into multiple groups. Uh, and I think that's where we have to go. Great. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, KT, I want to ask a question uh, to you that you alluded to in your previous comments, but would appreciate your, your further thoughts. So some people have raised this concern that the Me Too movement has been has moved away from supporting women and been framed as a political attack. And so, again, you talked about this a little bit earlier, but can you just talk more about, you know, how this occurred and, and talk about some of its broader implications? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I'm I'm going to be cautious about um, attributing it to the motives of the Me Too movement because I think the Me Too movement has uh, it's had its missteps, but it's also been dragged along in the in mm -hmm. the context of what happened in the Trump administration. So you know, the Me Too movement itself, as I alluded to earlier, was uh, started by Toronto Banks, who was or, or Burke, sorry, Toronto Burke, who was concerned about um, supporting women who had been the target. Um, or the victims of sexual harassment. And I think that that, uh, that it's sort of later iteration uh, on Twitter with encouraging people to indicate whether or not they had been uh, se sexually harassed um, drew a lot more attention and media attention to it. And then of course it got um, integrated into some of the events of the, the Trump administration, most notably the, the Kavanaugh hearings. One of the things that became a little bit frustrating, I think, in watching this happen is how um, Me Too became, as I said, politicized. And then there was a backlash, right? There was the Him Too movement that was uh, driven by the perception of some of the um, arguments about politicization, that these were, these were not women who actually experienced these attacks. This was a politically motivated effort um, or, 
as one of the more um, uh, prominent concerns about uh, him too argued, it's a it's a group of radical feminists with an ax to grind. Um, and one of the things that is concerning about that is that it it sort of detracts and takes away from the the universal or nearly universal idea that uh, sexual harassment in the workplace and sexual assault was a wrong that normatively we disagreed with. And so we might uh, quibble on the margins about whether or not it actually happened, but if it did happen, then it was problematic. And that if someone was making that argument, they they should be listened to. What it's What's happened now is that it's become uh, uh, women and perhaps even uh, radical feminist women uh, making political attacks. And so, for example, um, uh, in the recent debate over um, uh, Cuomo, uh, uh, Kristen Gillibrand said, why do you keep asking the women in Congress when it's time for him to resign? Why don't you ask other male congressmen? This isn't just our issue. This is a broader issue. And yet um, now it's become a uh, uh, a uh, much more gendered um, aspect. And so, um, again, the problem with that is that harassment stops being normatively a problem. It changes what harassment is as a conceptual manner. It's no longer about inequality. It's now part of the culture wars. Um, and so once that happens, it's much harder um, uh, to have a concerted effort to think about all of the women who are affected and in all the myriad ways they're affected and in the ways that this um, undermines inequality. And that's one of my concerns about what Trumpism has done uh, to sexual harassment and the Me Too movement. In some ways, it's defanged it and marginalized it as a, quote, women's issue, as opposed to a broader concern about equality. Great. Thank you. Um, next question is for Anne. So we we have seen uh, a tremendous amount of partisanship with regards to the COVID-19 response. So would this have happened under any president or are we simply so partisan now that there's simply no hope for a national response to uh, COVID-19 or any other pandemic? I'm unmuted now. Thank you for the question. I can really connect this, I think, to what to um, what I was drawing on earlier about about sort of Americans and volunteerism. I think, um, you know, uh, Trump had an opportunity to say, "I'm going to be the crisis president that leads us through this." And I think um, even you know e even people who didn't want to see the economy shut down or were were sort of reluctant to shelter in place um, would have followed him into that. Uh, I guess that the question then is, would Democrats have found some way to sort of reject Trump's leadership? But I think that um, that that there was a potential to kind of unite governors sort of across the spectrum around, let's try to do what we can to really sort of limit trans transmission and protect people. So in, in that sense, I think, you know, e even even Trump could have navigated this in a way that would have would have um, united Americans around uh, around a response. I mean, I think prior to COVID, I when I talked about the fact that I study um, partisanship or and scientific controversies around um, in partisanship, I would or, I would joke that you know that the one thing that unites everybody is that everybody wants a cure for cancer and everybody wants the folks head to toe in white suits to come to town if if there's an Ebola outbreak. And I think that I've now revised that. Um, and so I think it's possible. I think I think because of this American volunteer we are willing to follow leaders who cue to us what is the right response. Um, as, so as long as we have, you know, as long as Americans can, um, as, as, you know, political elites could come to some agreement about what COVID response would look like, I think Americans would be quite likely to, to, follow, um, to follow that leadership. Um, so I think it's, once again, it's, it's, it, it really matters who, is, who our elected officials are and what sort of leadership roles they take. Great. Thank you. So we are now going to spend the last 10 minutes of this, uh, of this panel answering questions from the audience. Um, the first question is, what actions do you suggest we need to take to shore up our democracy and move past Trumpism? So that's an open question for anyone. I just spoke and I don't know that I want to go first, but I, um, <laughs> I mean, there's, I don't, you know, first, first and foremost, 
is to protect voting rights um, and, and, and really make sure that everybody who's eligible and wants to participate has the opportunity to do so. That's, that's where, as a political scientist, that's, you knew I would say that, right? <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in. So I think it's a really important question. Just a couple of quick comments. First of all, uh, just think about January 6th again. People carrying a Confederate flag, attacking the Capitol, claiming that they're the patriots. What, 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 are they, what, part, what America are they patriotic in? Uh, you know, not a multiracial, inclusive America. Uh, they're the vision of America uh, and I, I forget which, which panel has said in terms of maybe it was you, Osagi, saying that part of saying the election was illegal is not illegal because uh, people who are not citizens voted, it's because Blacks voted, because mm -hmm. in a sense, people are participating who should not be citizens. How did, how did Black people get to be citizens in the first place? Uh, so in a way, uh, and uh, Howard Winner and Michael Omi writes about up until the 1930s and 40s, we had um, a racial dictatorship. Uh, to some extent, there's an effort by people to uh, move, to reject democracy, if democracy means uh, multiracial. Mm -hmm. And W.B. Du Bois talked about that. He said, we traded in democracy for racial hierarchy. And in a sense, we're back at that deal. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we have to do a couple of things. I think we have to sort of create those structures. And I think, frankly, uh, President Biden is doing a pretty good job. I think we have to offer olive branch. I think we have to actually, the voting rights thing is really, really important. And I'll stop, I mean, I can say a lot more, but after every court across the country have said, there's no widespread voter fraud, we have 250 uh, uh, laws being in 43 states, making it harder to vote. Essentially buying the Trump lie. Uh, mm -hmm. And the, the real thing is, is outcome oriented. How do we actually restructure society so that blacks, Latinos, uh, anyone who's not white and, and Christian, make it so they can't vote. If, if they've succeeded at that, we don't have a democracy. Uh, so that's the first thing. I mean, that's the most important thing. And, and, and it's not clear to me we can do that without getting rid of the filibuster. I can go into a lot more detail, but I think we need to actually reshore up our container. Our container has a crack in it. We're not just, you know, these are some not small discussions. And if the container breaks, then all bets are off. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And, you know, I want to follow on what uh, John said about democracy, because I think that um, the, the debate has been seen by uh, the, well, I shouldn't say the average American, but by many Americans as being not about democracy or if about democracy uh, uh, buying this claim that elections were stolen, even though there is no evidence. Um, it seems to me that some of the central values of democracy um, are ones that most Americans subscribe to uh, and could be put forward in such a way that people would uh, rally around them as part of uh, identity. If we're looking for something that, you know, 287 million Americans uh, believe in, um, perhaps it is democracy. And maybe that reflects my uh, childhood growing up in the Cold War era where democracy, for better or for worse, was was the ideology of the moment uh, put forward in, not only here but in the world as uh, central and important. But for example, what if we had a national holiday uh, on election day? Um, uh, the New York Times had a really telling uh, series of reactions from around the world and how we run our electoral system. Uh, the idea that you have to register, that you could wait in line for eight hours before you could vote, those kinds of things. So openness in voting and the importance of democracy. And then, um, although I won't say uh, civility, because I think civility can be used to silence, but participation and uh, an uh, a willingness to not uh, engage in uh, attacks against the speaker. I remember um, uh, there were some attacks against Obama as unpatriotic and uh, he turned around by Rick Perry and he turned around and said, you know, we don't attack our elected officials as unpatriotic. And he paused and he said, even if they argue they should secede from the union, which I thought was hugely amusing considering Rick Perry had suggested that Texas secede from the union, but also telling about what values matter, right? We don't attack uh, 
uh, our elected officials as not patriotic, we engage w- regarding ideas. And that sends a, a broader um, message about democracy uh, and engagement. And, you know, I realize that that's difficult. And John put his finger on how I think that, that there's a certain segment of the population, the white population, that is worried that if democracy is inclusive, then they don't want it. Um, but I don't think that that's everyone. And I think that there is a, a deep commitment to to democratic values that perhaps could be tapped here. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll keep it short uh, because we probably have other questions, but, uh, and I agree with um, the, you know, the structural um, suggestions here. I'll, I'll just make a pitch for education since that's my discipline is that one thing that we can do uh, better and we can emphasize what we've been doing well in education is is to promote more racial discussion, the racial history of this country, to you know, to to have racial literacy, right, and to promote that, and to um, leverage that against some of the claims by uh, Trump's cabinet that you know critical race theory is, is anti-American, that we have to challenge those kinds of ideas, and finally that it's not racist to talk about racism. Right, that that's um, a requirement of, of racial literacy is is to have a sense of uh, um, fluency, yeah, a sense of fluency in being able to talk about it, and it's not comfortable. That's not what I'm talking about. It's not going to be comfortable. It's going to be uncomfortable, but that that's part of being in sync with the problem of racism is that it should not be a comfortable conversation about a very uncomfortable situation we're in. So I'll just make a pitch for education or let's say racialized or racial education. Great, thank you. So we have a couple minutes left and so we have time for one more question um, from the audience. Uh, So the next question from the audience uh, member is many of the hate groups uh, that we saw um, or that we saw emerge during the Trump era were formed before Trump became president. Um, That is, he enabled them to become legitimate. So the question is, how can we work to change the norms of these groups, particularly in a post-Trump era? Well, I'll I'll jump in just one minute. Um, It's not a question you can answer in two and a half minutes, but uh, a lot of what's going on is not just hate. Uh, a, a number of the speakers have spoken to the role of leadership. Uh, and, and I know there's debate, is, is, was it always there and Trump just tapped into it? I'm of the opinion is it wasn't always there, that something is changing and leadership matters. Um, and um, Trump has created, there's, there's a more evidence of people identifying with what Zeus talked about in terms of white identity and white consciousness, that's relatively new uh, in America. Uh, and it's not just white in the terms of phenotype, it's white in terms of ideological positioning. Uh, and so people are taking their clues What Anne talked about in terms of like, before the, the, the before Trump came out against masks, uh, masks wearing on the, on the right and left, the Democrat and Republican is essentially the same. Mm-hmm. So people are taking cues. Um, so I do think we have to speak to this and then uh, what KT talked about in terms of, I think Americans still care about some issues, although it's hard because going back to Anne, if we don't agree on facts, it's hard to have a discussion about anything. Mm-hmm. Democracy or climate change. Uh, but I do think if, if uh, we need to engage in it, and I do think we need to offer people opportunities and I do think we have to reach out, but I also think we have to articulate and condemn white nationalism and white supremacy as being un-American. Uh, and inconsistent with our values as a democracy. Mm-hmm. I don't think that'll solve everything, but I think it has to be part of the discussion. Thank you. Again, I'll, I'll keep it short. Um, I think what happened with the colorblind era is that it pushed down right, a certain kind of ideology of whiteness. And in fact, that is the moral victory of the civil rights movement, right? that it made it unacceptable, at least in public spaces. You know, private spaces, that's a different conversation, but in public spaces, it made it unacceptable to talk about, you know, race or derisive ways of talking about blacks and other people of color in public spaces. It, but it doesn't mean those sentiments went away. They kind of got pushed underground, right? They, they went dormant. And I think with Trump, we found, we found a catharsis or that people found a catharsis. 
an expression for what they thought they pushed down all this time. And so I think um, whether we call it hate groups or alternative groups, et cetera, I do think engagement is going to be an important uh, answer to this, which is to say, um, have a, you know, a, a, you know, a more or less rational conversation about um, people's feelings and emotions and owning them and owning them and trying to have a dialogue and conversation about that and being clear what is not acceptable or to be condemned as John uh, um, pointed out. But I do think that um, Trump you know, was the outlet. He became the catharsis for what was pushed down and went underground for many decades and, and uh, finally percolated up again. Great, KT and Ann, we have a, a minute. So if you all want to add your thoughts. I'll, I'll just add a brief thought, which is, um, I think that, that uh, everyone has a sort of uh, leadership responsibility to speak up uh, um, about what is uh, radical and not necessarily representative. Um, yeah, I'm thinking of Beth Moore, who left the Southern Baptist um, uh, uh, Church in part by saying, "Look, I can't, I can't accept these uh, uh, these tenets as uh, part of my values." And I think that it may take um, more people being willing to stand up in that way, uh, including uh, white Christian leaders uh, on the left and and other uh, white leaders. Uh, saying, look, this is not, this is not uh, who we are as Americans, and, and this is not uh, acceptable. Thank you. I can just briefly say that um, I think, you know, Joe Biden is the president and he's white and he has an opportunity to, uh, to articulate just what, um, you know, just he has an opportunity to articulate that is not patriotic. This is not, it's not American to, for, for these, what these groups are asserting is, a, is, a, is a patriotic, is, is unpatriotic. If we hear that from Biden and if he, if he's forceful about it, um, then I think that could, that could go at least partway to um, making sure these conversations are happening and modeling what kind of leadership needs to, needs to come from elected officials across the political spectrum. Great. So thank you so much to our, our panelists uh, for sharing their thoughts with us today. And I want to thank the audience for joining us. Um, the uh, the edited volume Trumpism and its discontents is available for free online at the Othering and Belonging Institute and the Institute for Governmental Studies. So you can check it out and download it from there. I also want to give a special thanks to our sponsors uh, for this event, which include the Othering and Belonging Institute, the Center for Right Wing Studies, the Center for Race and Gender, and the Institute for Governmental Studies. Uh, thanks again, and I uh, hope you all have a, a wonderful weekend. Take care. Thank you, Osaki.